Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. If you uh, can't, I'm sure you will let me know. Um, so I'll just go through an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, most of you are probably familiar with mindfulness, but I'll give you a quick overview of what, how we define it, what is mindfulness, and tell you a bit about the program that we've been studying that we call Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery. And then I'll talk about some research we've uh, completed already called the Mindset Study. Some people may not be familiar with it, and specifically how the results of the Mindset Study have led us to our current study that we call MATCH. Um, and how we're building on what we learned in mindset in this new study protocol, which is um, fairly uh, new design and kind of interesting. I, at least I think it is. All right. So what is mindfulness? So we define it as paying attention on purpose in the present moment with an open and accepting attitude. So you can boil that down to three components. Um, what we kind of call the why, that's intention. So why are you interested in practicing mindfulness? And this can be very simple, just I want to be more in the moment, um, you know, I want to control my symptoms or I want to be more compassionate or I want to become enlightened, you know, a whole range of intentions, attention. So that's kind of the what, the heart of the practice is skills to regulate attention so that we can learn to be more in our lives while they're happening. And the third component is the attitude with which we approach it. And that's very important too. So the attitude has to be open and accepting and kind rather than harsh and judgmental. So here we've got a little drawing. The question is who's doing better, the dog or the person? And then I think you can see the dog's winning. Um, so we can think about mindfulness is very simple, this present moment awareness. But where is your mind usually? And if you begin to pay attention to that, you'll find that often, as you see in the drawing, it's cluttered with things from the past or the future. So if you're ruminating on the past and thinking, oh, why me, or if only this, or if only that, or I should have said this, could have done that, that will lead to feelings of regret and anger and depression. Or if you're often racing off to the future, thinking about what if this happens, or what if that, or how am I going to cope, or how am I going to get all this done, and all the pressures of my to-do list, you can see that would just lead to worry and stress and anxiety. Um, yeah, so just going back to this a second. So, you know, this idea of mindfulness is simple, but it's not easy to train our minds to do this. So people have developed training programs to help, help us with that. And the most well-known that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, or MBSR, developed by John Kabat-Zinn um, way back in the late 70s now. It's been a while. Um, and he's written this wonderful book, Full Catastrophe Living, that describes the program. I think it's in its second or third edition, and it's well worth reading if you haven't. And what he did was combine sort of more um, psychological principles of stress reduction with meditation techniques more from Eastern philosophies. And he came and boiled it down into an eight-week program that's get, delivered in a group format. It's fairly structured. And over the years, it's really taken off, and there's hundreds now, um, um, probably thousands of studies applying at the MBSR program to a broad range of psychological um, and physical disorders. So I just refer you to a website, mindfulexperience.org. That's the American Mindfulness Research Association, and they summarize all the research over the years there if you're interested. Now, at the Tom Baker Cancer Center, um, in 1996, my colleagues Michael Specka, Maureen Angan, and Eileen Goody um, sat down and said, you know, it would be nice to offer some kind of yoga and meditation to our patients. Um, they weren't familiar with John Kabat-Zinn at that time, so they started developing a program based on their own personal practices. Um, and then I showed up in 1998, or actually I showed up in 1997, and was familiar with John Kabat-Zinn, and so we began adapting the program based on the UMass model, but also taking into account the needs of cancer patients. And so our program has been offered clinically since that time. It's open to any cancer patients and any support people and family members. Over the years, we've um, had more than 2,000 people. We offer the program in groups of 15 to 20 um, at a time. And so we have this ongoing clinical program, and we embed the research studies often within the clinical program. Um, so over the years, we came to call it Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, um, based on our program in that, that began in 1998. Um, and we adapted this name. And Michael Speck and I have since written this book called Mindfulness-Based Can Cancer Recovery as well that came out in 2011. Now, this is a very patient-centered book. It's um, you know, not that thick, it's easy to read, and it actually covers the curriculum with detailed exercises and scripts. And so it's meant as a home study guide for uh, 
for anybody, really, for you know, patients or support people or just the general public. So in terms of the MBCR program design, it's also an eight-week intervention. Our sessions um, are about an hour and a half. Um, we've extended them a little bit to an hour and three quarters, so typically one or two instructors. And they always follow the same format. We begin with a discussion where we check in with home practice. There's some didactic material um, that we teach people around stress, reacting, responding, coping, different topics. And we always have mindful yoga and different types of meditation practice. So over the weeks, we'll introduce a body scan, sitting meditation, walking meditation, et cetera. We follow a booklet which outlines the program, includes a bibliography, and people commit to daily home practice of 45 minutes and we give them CDs with guided meditations and guided yoga. They keep track of how much time they spend doing this, and we have a six-hour silent retreat between weeks six and seven. So the components, the overarching theme is mindfulness, trying to cultivate mindfulness in both formal practice and informally throughout the day. We teach them about relaxation, how to use their breath and deep breathing to control their state of arousal and relaxation. The gentle yoga is a form of mindful movement. It's that, that key core component of the program. We talk about the mind-body connection. We use some strategies of visualization and imagery. There's a component of cognitive coping. It comes from cognitive behavior therapy with some adaptations. There's a strong element of personal empowerment so that people are doing something for themselves in a time when they often feel very unempowered and feel like a, a loss of control. And there's a strong element of social support because it's in a group setting. Um, and I think especially for people with cancer, this can be uh, really helpful just to be with other people who understand what they're going through. So I'm not going to go through uh, past research results except to summarize them in this slide. So we began looking at symptomatology like stress symptoms, mood, anger, anxiety, depression, um, symptoms like sleep problems, fatigue, and uh, more mechanistic things like rumination and worry. Those things all improve over the course of the program. We also see improvements of quality of life, spirituality, more positive outcomes like post-traumatic growth or benefit finding and improvements in overall levels of mindfulness. We've also looked at some biological functions over the years um, and seen improvements in blood pressure, uh, changes in cortisol rhythms, changes in inflammatory cytokines, and uh, telomere length. And I'm going to show you some of that data in a moment. So I'll focus now on just the mindset study. So mindset began in, I think, 2006 or seven. it was a five-year study with Calgary and Vancouver, and we think it was fairly innovative because, for one thing, we included only distressed participants. Um, it was breast cancer survivors, but they had to have a four or higher on the distress thermometer to be included in the study because we knew they were most likely to benefit, but that cuts out about 70% of the interested people, so logistically it makes it difficult. We were doing comparative effectiveness of two empirically supported treatments, so it wasn't just mindfulness or some intervention compared to usual care or control. It was actually head-on comparison of two interventions that were both already shown to be effective. We also included a third control arm um, of people who had a minimal intervention, and then after a period of three months, they were re-randomized into one of the two interventions. I'll show you a flow chart in a moment that helps illustrate that. And we had both psychological and biological outcomes was powered for moderator analysis, which means we could look at baseline differences and try to predict, moving towards this idea of personalized medicine, who's going to do better in which type of intervention based on what we know about them and their disease. And we had a full year of follow-up. Um, it still is the largest study of its kind to date and was a multi-site trial with Calgary and Vancouver. So the other intervention that we compared was called Supportive Expressive Group Therapy, or SET. This has been around for a long time as well, developed based on theory and process of group psychotherapy from Irvin Yalom with David Stiegel in Stanford, based on principles of emotional expression and mutual support. So they talk about enhancing openness, emotional expressiveness, talking about the changed view of the self and the body image after a cancer diagnosis, discussion of coping skills and communication with patients as well as um, other family members and a detoxification of feelings around death and dying. So more of a traditional support group, um, professionally facilitated. So what were the research questions? We wanted to know what the comparative changes pre to post were among the three groups, so the two interventions and the control on the psychological outcome variables, same thing for the biological variables, and then this question of moderators. So what baseline factors are related to improvements on the outcomes in each of the two interventions? And what were the long-term effects over six months and a year um, of the two interventions on the various outcomes? 
So there was a range of baseline measures. You can sort of see here we had the typical demographics, disease characteristics, health behaviors. And then for moderators, we had, we were interested in emotional repression, emotional suppression. So that's the sort of unconscious versus conscious repression or suppression of emotions. We looked at personality using the NEO five-factor index and the impact of patient preferences on outcomes. And these were the range of outcome measures. So we looked at mood, stress, quality of life, spirituality, social support, and benefit finding. And those are the measures we used to do so. And we also looked at biological outcome measures. So we looked at salivary cortisol slopes, which is a marker of um, the stress hormone. So it's a marker of what's happening with your HPA axis. That's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that controls stress responding. And so we looked um, over four days, three times a day, so we could look at slopes of change across the day. Um, a new outcome was telomere lengths, and I'll tell you a bit about why we did that and what the results were when we get there. And we also were interested in cytokines, so these are um, inflammatory markers of the immune system. Uh, I won't talk about those results because they didn't work out. The lab messed up, unfortunately. It's happened, right? Um, okay, the first outcome. So what are the comparative changes on the psychological variables? So this is our flow chart, and I'll walk you through it here. So you can see there's 273 participants who completed the baseline, and there's a breakdown between Vancouver and Calgary. And then they were randomized into the mindfulness group, that's MBCR, the SET group, or the stress management seminar. That was the control condition, so it was a one-day seminar. There's half as many people in that group. And then they were all assessed post. You can see there's some attrition here. And in fact, that's a 33% attrition. So half the people, about 20% dropped out of the intervention, um, you know, and another 15 or so percent didn't complete the, um, the questionnaires, which is unfortunate, but um, we're still able to analyze the data. And then the rest of it shows you the six-month and 12-month follow-up, and I won't be going through that today. So here's the demographics. Who are we talking about? So they were all breast cancer survivors, about 55 years of age, about two years post-diagnosis. About two-thirds of them were cohabiting or married. 60% were working either full or part-time. Another third of them were retired. And about three-quarters had greater than high school education, so a fairly highly educated sample. And most of the women had either stage one or stage two breast cancer. So looking at our primary outcomes on the POMS mood disturbance, so higher scores are more mood disturbance. The blue lines are the mindfulness purple lines are supportive, expressive, and the green line is the stress management seminar. So what you can see here is a greater decrease pre to post intervention in the mindfulness group. Oops. And that was statistically significant. Greater change in the mindfulness group, more improvement there. And similarly with the stress symptoms, we saw the same kind of pattern, although the magnitude wasn't as large, but a greater decrease in stress symptoms in the mindfulness group compared to the others. And the same thing with quality of life. So this is the pattern we saw throughout, is that there may have been some improvement in supportive expressive, but typically greater improvement in mindfulness compared to control. And then when we looked at the biological outcomes, I'm going to give you a little uh, primer on cortisol. So what happens normally is that as right after you wake up is the peak of cortisol, and there's a downward slope throughout the day. So it decreases, and it's at its lowest point just after you go to bed. Now, in some illnesses, the cortisol slope is shown to be disrupted. So in major depression, you see a flatter slope, and it's also a higher average level. In other conditions like chronic pain or PTSD, the slope is also flatter, but at a lower level. And those indicate some disruption in the HPA axis feedback or regulation. Now, why is this important in cancer? Well, this is a study from 2000 from David Spiegel's group, and he divided women with metastatic cancer into those who had a steeper slope, the top line, and those who had a flatter slope, and then monitored, monitored them for over seven years and just looked at survival. So what you're seeing here, for example, at the four-year point is that the women with the steeper slopes, so the more normal, healthier slopes, 60% of them are still alive, but only 30, actually less than 30% of the women with the flat slope are surviving. So there is potentially a real significance of this measure in terms of clinical disease outcomes. So what happened in this group? Okay, here's, I'm not showing you the change in cortisol over the day, I'm just showing you that change in the average slope. So what we're seeing here, actually, is that for the mindfulness group and the set group, the slopes are becoming slightly steeper, so there's a decrease in the slope. But for the stress management group, the slope is becoming flatter. So when you compare them together, you're seeing a difference between the groups. 
what this means in terms of clinical outcomes, we don't really know, but we are seeing this shift towards healthier slopes in the intervention group. Um, and when we looked at each time point, this seems to be driven by the bedtime one. Remember I said there was three times, there was morning, afternoon, and bedtime. So what you're seeing is no change in bedtime cortisol in the mindfulness or the supportive expressive groups, but in the control group, there's an increase in bedtime cortisol, leading to a flatter slope. And the worst time to have elevated cortisol is at bedtime when you're supposed to be going to sleep because it can really disrupt your different regulatory system. And there it is there. So that's what happened with the cortisol data. With the telomere length, this is a new outcome we were interested in. You may have heard a bit about this. The telomeres are the protein complexes at the ends of chromosomes, and they provide genomic stability. They typically shorten with aging, and that's a fairly normal biological process. But what people have been interested in is what, how it's related to disease and how stress affects telomeres. So dysfunction in telomeres can result in DNA damage or cell death and make people more susceptible to many diseases including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and also cancer. Telomere length is also associated with life stress. So people who report having a lot more life stress or chronic life stress tend to have shorter telomeres than other people who are matched on age and other demographics. And as I said, in cancer, these shorter telomeres are associated with increased risk of developing cancer and decreased survival. So we thought it would be interesting to see if a short-term psychosocial intervention could impact this outcome, and no one had shown that previously. So we had data just on 88 participants from Calgary because we needed blood samples. And the way you look at this is called a T to S ratio. So it's a relative t t telomere length compared to the average of all the samples. Um, so the ratio is the length of the specific sample relative to the reference. And here's what we want to focus on here. So what happened before I talk about this is that there was no difference between the mindfulness and the supportive expressive groups on telomere lengths pre or post. So we lumped them together and called them the treatment group. So what we see at baseline here is that there's no difference between treatment and control on their average telomere lengths, but here at post-treatment, there it comes, there's a decrease in telomere length, so a shortening of telomere length in the controls and again a maintenance in the intervention groups. So this was the first study that had shown the possibility that short-term psychosocial interventions could impact uh, something at the level of, of the DNA, the telomere length. All right, so that takes us to the third question. What baseline factors are related to improvements on the primary outcomes in each of the interventions? And this is actually what's going to feed into the next part of the study talking um, about the MATCH study. So remember the baseline measures here, we looked at emotional repression, so subconsciously repressing, repressing emotions. The emotional suppression, which is doing it on purpose, just saying I can't think about that, I don't want to go there. With the personality, the NEO measures um, conscientiousness, neuroticism, extroversion, openness to experience and agreeableness. And then we also looked at patient preferences. So before they were randomized, were they hoping to get the mindfulness group or the support group or the stress management seminar? All right, so we'll first we'll look at the effect of personality on outcomes. Um, so we did this through multiple regression analysis and we looked at all those variables I talked about. So suppression, repression, all the personality variables on each of the mood of the outcome. So mood, stress, quality of life, social support. There's a whole bunch of different analyses we're doing here and you don't need to worry too much about the statistics. 28 different analyses. But of all those, there's only two effects. So basically what that told us is that all these things that we thought might be important in predicting outcome in either of these programs, they weren't. The only thing we saw was you know, a minor effect of agreeableness on one outcome, I think, social support. So really against what we had hypothesized. But what did come out as important was patient preferences. And I don't know if you can see this very well, but at baseline, the majority of participants preferred the mindfulness, so 55% of them. Well, there's something wrong with this slide. It's supposed to be 55%. Right, I can show you here. Preferred MBSR. 13% preferred set. 16% actually wanted the stress management seminar, and some of them had no preference. So when you look at who got what they wanted, only 30% were randomized into their preferred program just due to the allocation ratios and whatnot. So this shows you what their preference was in the light blue and what they actually got in the dark blue. So 30% got what they wanted. But then when we look at, well, this is first, firstly looking at trying to predict what people are going to prefer based on their personality. So the first one here shows you that 
extroverted people were more likely to prefer the support group to the stress management seminar, and that makes sense, right? They want to interact with other people. Um, the extroverted people were also more likely to prefer mindfulness to the stress management seminar, again, a group-based program. The conscientious people, on the other hand, were more likely to prefer the stress management seminar. They could learn something and take notes, perhaps. And also the more neurotic people preferred the mindfulness over the stress management. So that gave us some indication of how personality could predict preferences. And then we looked at effective preferences on the outcomes. So here we just divided people into whether they got their preferred program or their non-preferred program. So this goes across the different interventions. And it doesn't look like a big effect, but it's statistically significant showing here that if you got your preferred program, you improve more on symptoms of stress. And you see it more strikingly here with quality of life. So people who got their preferred program, whatever it was, even if it was the control group, they improved more on quality of life than people who were randomly assigned to something that they didn't prefer or they hadn't chosen. So let's summarize that a little bit. First of all, preference matters. And that was surprising to us because we thought that a lot of the other baseline characteristics would be more important than preference, but they weren't. So in this case, they were more important than the other baseline characteristics or the demographics. So knowing this, it should be measured in future randomized controlled trials, right? Because, so for example, in our trial, we showed the mindfulness intervention was the most effective on the outcome, but it was also the most preferred, right? So more people would be getting what they wanted if they got that intervention. So there's going to be some confounding there. So better yet, can you manipulate preference to understand its role in treatment outcomes? So I'll just summarize the mindset study, and then we'll move on to the match study. So I didn't go through the fourth question with the long-term results, um, but I can tell you, well, I'll get to it in a second, then I'll summarize it. So we saw the mindfulness group improve more on mood and stress relative to control and set. They also improved more on quality of life relative to control. Both intervention groups maintained steeper cortisol slopes and longer telomer length than control group. Mindfulness was the preferred treatment. Only 31% of people got their preferred treatment. And the women who did get their preferred treatment improved more on stress and quality of life. And here's the long-term results. The mindfulness participants improved more than the set group on all of the outcomes, and they maintained all these benefits over 12 months. All right, so now I'll talk to you about the MATCH study. So this is called Mindfulness and Tai Chi for Cancer Health is the short version of it. It's actually a preference-based, randomized, controlled trial, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's a pragmatic, preference-based, comparative efficacy trial. So what does that mean, actually? I'll tell you in a second. So the question is, is mindfulness, or MBCR, which was the treatment that had the best outcomes in the mindset study, um, how's it going to fare head-to-head -head with a, another mind-body intervention that also has some evidence of efficacy. So in this case, we chose Tai Chi and Qigong. Why did we choose Tai Chi and Qigong? Um, just because there's growing evidence of their efficacy on a range of similar outcomes, uh, as well as quite a few psychoneuroimmunology studies looking at effects on the immune system and showing that there were some effects. And it's really not been as well studied as the mindfulness or the yoga. Um, and so, and also a lot of the research had been in non-English languages, so in Korea, in Japan. So we thought it was quite promising and it would be interesting to see how it stacks up against the mindfulness. It also has quite a few elements of mindfulness as well. So what did we do in the design here? We've included a weightless control component in, in we've got preference-based and randomized arms. We're screening for distress again to include only distressed participants. In this case, it's going to be people with any type of cancer, not just breast cancer patients. Um, and we will have a six-month follow-up. So the objectives of the study are to compare MBCR and TCQ to each other and a weightless control condition using this innovative, randomized, preference-based comparative effectiveness trial design, taking into account potential moderating factors, again, that might predict differential response. We've got a range of different outcomes. So we're going to include a lot of biological outcomes, um, such as immune markers, blood pressure, heart rate variability, so some of the psychophysiology stuff we hadn't done previously, uh, looking at stress hormones, also looking again at cellular aging and adding in this measure of gene expression as well. So I'm going to take some time with this slide. This shows you the study design. 
Um, so you can see it's really busy. There's lots of arms. So we start at the beginning with people, you know, screening. We have to screen about 2,700 people to get 600 who are eligible, and we're going to start with 600 people who consent. And then in the green, you've got the preference-based arms. So we ask people after they consent, so do you have a preference for mindfulness or Tai Chi? And if they say, yeah, I, I do have a preference, then they get what they want. So we're not randomizing those people. So that's all these green arms, the preference-based arms. Now the people who say, no, I don't have a preference, they're going to go in all the blue arms. So let's go through this green arms here. So the people who have a preference for mindfulness, they get it. Hopefully we can, you know, balance out these arms with about 100 people there. The pre people who have preference for Tai Chi, they're in the white boxes with the green. And then what we're going to do too, because we thought about not having any control condition, but then we would only have the two active interventions. And it's difficult to interpret changes when there's no no treatment control, especially on some of the novel biomarker type of outcomes. We know that both of these interventions are likely to be effective. So for people in the preference arms, they're going to get what they prefer, but they are randomized within that to either get it right away, so they immediately they get it, or they're in a wait list. So that's this dark green group, the preference combined wait list. So half as many people who prefer Tai Chi and who prefer mindfulness to combine into this group of 100 people. So the waitlist group and the immediate groups are assessed at baseline. And then after the intervention, there's a post-assessment. So the waitlist people are still waiting. They haven't had the intervention. The other two groups have had their interventions. And then after that, people get what they choose. So that's these little boxes down here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, so after the waitlist period, then they get their preferred intervention. If they want a Tai Chi, they get that. If they want a mindfulness, they get that. And then these people are also assessed post and six-month follow-up. So everyone gets a six-month follow-up. So hopefully that makes it clear. And then when we come over to the other side here, in the blue boxes, that's your, actually this is exactly the same design as mindset was. That's your randomized controlled trial. So these people say, oh, I'm kind of interested in both. I don't have a specific preference. Well, great. They're either going to get mindfulness immediately, Tai Chi immediately, or you're going to wait and then get mindfulness or Tai Chi. So those are the kind of four groups, really. Um, so it's the same kind of thing. The, the blue groups are the mindfulness groups. So they either get it immediately, pre, post, and six months. Um, the white boxes with the blue outlines are the Tai Chi group, either immediately or post, and then six months. And then you've got your wait list. So they wait for the initial period, and then they're randomized into one or the other, and they get the post-assessment and the six-month follow-up. So it's quite a complicated design. Nobody has done this before. We don't know how the numbers are going to fall out um, in terms of preference versus no preference, um, and we will just see as we go along. So the inclusion criteria are anyone, men and women, over the age of 18, any type of cancer. So we're trying to be very, very broad. Um, we're working with principles of generalizability and more sort of a pragmatic trial. They have to be completed active treatment, and that's really only because of all the biomarker analyses that can really be confounded by uh, effects of treatment on those things. Um, so surgery, chemo, radiation at least four months previously, but they can still be taking the long-term therapies, you know, the uh, tamoxifen, the aromatase inhibitors, um, some of the other hormonal therapies. They need to be experiencing significant distress, so four or greater on the distress thermometer, again, um, we know and we've seen in our research and other people have seen too that if people are doing really well at the beginning, obviously they're not going to improve that much and then you, you won't be able to make distinctions, so you need to have that. Um, obviously they need to be able to attend the classes, so these are in-person classes, they're going to be matched for time, and they have to have sufficient functional capacity to participate. Um, and this is a little more stringent when we add in the Tai Chi Qi Gong because it is a bit more uh, strenuous. So we have a way of assessing that. And of course, the ability to speak and write in English to do the questionnaires. So the outcomes are very similar to the kind of things we've looked at before in terms of psychological outcomes. So we'll look at mood, stress levels, quality of life. Um, I'm not sure that we determine the positive outcomes. You have to balance out the burden to participants as well as what you want to learn. So we are interested in benefit finding and spirituality. Probably add those in. And then the physical outcomes we're looking at are things like fatigue, sleep, pain levels, and we've added in 
some things we haven't done previously, looking at balance and fitness, so um, the ability to, you know, how far, how quickly can you walk a certain distance, how long can you balance on one foot, grip strength, more of these physical measures. And then for the biological measures, we have things we've done previously, like the salivary cortisol, where we showed changes in the steepness of the slopes. Um, cytokines, I mentioned briefly that we had tried to look at the cytokines um, in the mindset study, but the, they hadn't worked with the lab. So we're working with a different lab and going to be able to look at these uh, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, again, we'll be looking at telomere lengths, which I went over previously. We're adding in this idea of gene expression. Um, so this has become very popular in kind of the psychobiology world, um, looking at associations between psychological stress or depression and what's happening at the level of the genes actually expressing proteins. So there's a lab down in California who's going to be doing that with us. Um, and they can group gene expression by function as well. So it's quite interesting there. And then we'll be looking at the psychophysiology um, through a master's student um, at the University of Calgary working with Tavis Campbell. And this is looking at uh, blood pressure. We're actually not doing ambulatory. We're going to do clinic blood pressure now and look at heart rate variability. Um, and that's a marker, actually a very good marker of risk for lots of cardiovascular outcomes as well as diabetes and that sort of thing. Oh, and we've also added in health economic measures. So this is the whole idea of trying to understand what we call cost offsets or uh, quality adjusted life years. So the idea that participating in a psychosocial intervention can actually benefit the system as a whole by preventing a lot of those uh, visits for, you know, emergency room visits for anxiety or having to see psychiatrists for um, treatment for depression. Um, and also looking at return to work and those sorts of things. And so we're going to be adding in, working with a health economist to add in a number of those different measures as well. So we think that both mindfulness and Tai Chi will be superior to control on all of the outcome measures. And looking at specificity, we think the Tai Chi might be better than the mindfulness on the physical outcomes related more to balance and fitness because there is more an emphasis on that. We think mindfulness will be better. Oh, see, I press it once and nothing happened. Anyway, <laughs> mindfulness will be better than Tai Chi on the psychological outcomes, um, potentially. Although the Tai Chi people think that the Tai Chi is also going to help with the psychological outcomes, so we'll see. Um, and so, in terms of the preference, it's really quite neat because we're able to look with the kind of design we have. We can actually compare the people who, for example, in the mindfulness group who preferred it and got what they preferred to the people who were just randomized to the mindfulness group who didn't show any strong preference. So you can actually isolate the effect of preference by comparing those two groups, the people who got the same intervention but preferred it versus randomized to it. So we think that people who get their preferred treatment will improve more than people who are randomized to the same treatment. And that kind of shows you, you know, the effect of this expectancy and ideas around treatment credibility and preference um, beyond just the actual impact of the intervention itself. And we think the improvements will persist over the six-month follow-up for both intervention groups. And in terms of cortisol, we think they'll show steeper cortisol slopes or changes in cortisol slopes to, to become steeper pre- to post-intervention compared to control, similar to what we saw in the mindset study. So we've compiled or brought together a big team of people um, with different uh, backgrounds to help us with that. So myself and Michael Speck is the mindfulness expert, Tavis Campbell is the psychophysiologist, Janine D.C. Davis also with a background in psychophysiology, Peter Wayne is our Tai Chi expert, <coughs> Tara Beatty is the telomere biologist, Kamala Patel is the immunologist, Steve Cole does the gene expression, Herb Emery is the health economist, Pete Ferris is our biostatistician, Jill Nation is an oncologist helping us with recruitment. Linda Balneves is the PI in Toronto, um, and actually there's a few people off the table here, so she's got a team of people in Toronto, Philip Peng, uh, Bruce Song, and Raymond Wong, who are all um, affiliated with different hospitals and have done Tai Chi research and practice. So we've got a team that spans all the different uh, requirements. And so progress today, um, it was funded by the HECT Foundation. They're a private foundation run out of BC, and they fund um, different complementary uh, therapy trials in cancer. 
So we got our funding just last fall. We've been having monthly team calls, doing setups. We've hired a study coordinator, a postdoc called Aaron Zielinski. We have ethics approval in Calgary. We have submitted ethics in Toronto. Uh, that's kind of where we are to date. Whoops. Oh, and we've been working on developing the specific protocols. With mindfulness is already in place, and working with all the Tai Chi people to develop a protocol that's going to be standardized and based on previous research. So our future timelines, um, the next few months, we'll be identifying and training the mindfulness and Tai Chi facilitators in both Calgary and Toronto, developing all the online data collection forms, the recruitment materials, recruitment strategies. You know, we have to get a lot of people interested in the study uh, to be able to meet our numbers. And because we're doing all the blood collection and saliva collection, there's a lot to be done around lab protocols. And we need to pre-test our methods with some participants as well before we launch. We plan to begin recruitment in June <clears throat> with screening and baseline assessments in Calgary. Um, hopefully Toronto will be the same time frame, um, but there's a bit more setup to be done there. And the first cohorts will begin their interventions in September or October. So the five-year study, at least three years of um, running the interventions, um, and hopefully only three years, but depending on what our recruitment rates are like. So just the acknowledgments here. So this is um, people who've been involved in the whole endeavor, um, including the mindset study, so a number of funders over the years, um, collaborators. You can see there's many people involved, mindfulness teachers, set therapists, postdocs, many research assistants, students, and research administration over the years. So just an acknowledgement to those people. This couldn't happen without them. And there's my contact information. Um, so if you're interested in any of those publications I mentioned, you can actually download them from my website, lindacarlson.ca. Um, and feel free to send me an email if there's questions around study or anything else. And that's it. Thank you.